Here with us on set right now to talk about health care and other policy issues affecting your money is Senator Heidi Heitkamp from North Dakota. Senator, thank you for joining thank us Becky. this morning. Well, thanks for having me. All right, so let's, let's talk through the politics and what we're going to see in this entire hashing out of the Senate bill. Uh, we know the CBO score is going to come out, but we also know that there are going to be a lot of tweaks and changes trying to get senators to agree to this. So how do you think it kind of shakes out? Well, you have to look at it from a mile high, and they're trying to tell you we're going to keep coverage the same, no one's going to get hurt, and we're going to take billions of dollars out of health care. So you're I mean, saying it doesn't add up? No, none of this adds up. And I think once it's parsed and once people have a chance to take a look at it, it's only going to get more difficult. One of the great challenges you have is that it's not just Obamacare that's being amended. Medicaid, as we know it, will change. It will go to a per cap system. And that's created incredible insecurity in, in states like mine with a lot of moms who have disabled kids, a lot of folks who have relied on that Medicaid program for a lot of years, elderly in nursing homes. No one knows what that's going to mean. That, that may actually be the more significant part that's being changed here. I mean, you, you know that Obamacare was going to get kind of pushed around and different things, but the idea of, of, of having a cap on Medicaid for the first time ever. Well, when I talk about this, I say this isn't Obamacare reform. This is entitlement reform. And I think that the speaker has long wanted to cap or at least limit um, entitlement spending. That's what this is. And now it's getting really a much bigger exposure. But the challenge that you have is that when I have a question about it, where do I ask? Is there a committee hearing where I can vet this? And, and that's one of the problems that I think they have is that everybody, everybody's saying one thing and then somebody else says something else and it just kind of ratchets up. But if you have a committee hearing, you can have that conversation in committee hearing. It's awfully hard to have that conversation on, on the floor. I mean, I, in all honesty, your vote doesn't matter here. You, nope. You're going to have a no vote. They're looking at their 52 members and, and trying to figure out where they're going to get them at that point. But I think my participation on behalf of the people of North Dakota matters, and that's why I've spent an incredible amount of time. I was one of the few senators who actually sat down in a bipartisan way to talk about whether there was common ground. But when people say we've, we've reached out, that's not true. Certainly the majority leader has not reached out. And they've wanted to do this alone. They chose reconciliation mm -hmm. as the process to use uh, to do it and so um, this is way too important a sixth of the economy and life and death for a lot of people in North Dakota and across the country you shouldn't be doing it this way you, you know one one point we, we can say that their bill is going to hurt all of these people that are out there their answer would be we're not trying to be mean we're trying to cut the budget deficits we're trying to get to the point where we can get our arms around this how how, how, how do you respond back to that what, what's your answer one one of the things that that I talk about is I say um, what you will hear from Republicans is we can't afford it and I had an insurance executive tell me well the states can't afford it either and there's where the rubber meets the road health care costs too much it costs too much for employers it costs too much for the government we need to get our arms around it but there's nothing in this bill that's going to curtail costs if we took people there, there's been a study 14% of the American population has four or more chronic diseases, which cost the health care system 40%. What if you drop them out, put them in a managed care, took them out of the insurance pools, it would, it would lower the risk for the rest of um, folks this, and it would improve quality. This is the same quality. complaint that people have with Obamacare, that while it was interested in trying to make sure people were insured, it didn't bend the health yeah. care cost curve, that we have been kind of dancing around this problem for decades. Yeah, and, and they would say it did, I would say it didn't. When I was campaigning in 12 people to ask me, what do you think about Obamacare? I say, can we talk about health care first? Mm -hmm. And they would just kind of look at me like, what's, what's the difference? And I would talk about my work in tobacco control. You know, look at what we've been able to do in public health and tobacco control. We need an, a surge and a program exactly like that for a lot of chronic disease. Something like diabetes. And, and the challenge that you have right now is that a lot of chronic disease goes untreated because of behavior and mental health. And if you want to look at who's the Medicaid population, it tends to be people with behavior and mental health problems at a much greater percentage. You take a look at North Dakota, 14% of the profits or the uh, recovery of expenses 
patients comes from Medicaid in a general hospital, it's 60 to 70 percent for people with chronic, with, with behavior and mental health issues. You've got to get those people into the system so you can lower costs of care. On top of that, there's just a lack of transparency in the system. I mean, and nobody knows what they're paying for at any one point in time. I mean, you think that your insurance company is going to take care of it. And so there is no ability to say, you know what, this costs this much money the price versus this. Exactly. The and if you wanted to, you cannot do that. You know, it's interesting because I think there's new emerging, and you probably have had some on your show, where you see like uh, image centers that don't take insurance. Right. If you want to apply for insurance, mm -hmm. go. Your, your x-ray is one fifth the cost of what it would be if you got it through a managed system. But, but you know, again, you're cherry picking. And so you've got to look at the impacts of all of that. You know, when my father had cancer and died in the early 80s, my job was to take the medical bills and compare them to the insurance payment. It was impossible. It's still impossible. That's not the right way to run this because you want the consumers to have some skin in the game. So unlike a lot of people on my side, I think health savings accounts could be that thing that drives cons good consumer decision making. So that but, you are very interested in making sure you're right. getting the best price. But like Melissa said, it, it's impossible to even find well, that out until it, after the fact. Think, think about this. If you went in and said, I need to get my gallbladder out, right. what would happen? They would say, what, uh, how much will that cost? They'd say, well, what's your insurance? You want to say, what's that got to do with it? How much <laughs> does it cost to um, remove my gallbladder? And they say, well, it depends on your insurance. And that's, that's the lack of transparency in this system. Clearly you're not happy with the, the way the Republicans are going about this, but have they at least made some improvement? Do you prefer the Senate bill to the House bill, or, or, or are they much the same? No, I think the Senate bill might even be worse. Um, because the of the changes, term, yeah. The and then there's a capping, which I haven't gotten a, a handle on. You know, Obamacare said once Medicaid expansion or Medicaid reaches a certain percentage of GDP, they actually lowered that percentage of GDP. So what you might be expecting if you're a state in terms of Medicaid match, you might not get if we hit the cap on GDP. You mentioned that you were in part of a cross-party uh, discussion group originally on this. What are the areas that both parties do actually agree on? Are there areas? I think that everybody should agree, uh, we'll put it that way, they should agree that younger, healthy families are disadvantaged on the exchanges and you've got to fix that. You've got to take care of the fact that they are subsidizing older, sicker people. I don't think it's by changing the ratio one to three to one to five. That's why you hear AARP talking about the age tax. Mm -hmm. But you've got to do something to get people with chronic diseases out of the system. And I think that's where the rubber meets the road. It was interesting because a colleague of mine came in on the Republican side and said, how about if we just take these people that are high risk and drop them out mm -hmm. and let the insurance market work again? Which would, but what would you do with them? Like they would be well, you would have to put it by yeah, Medicaid, right? You so. would have to put them in some kind of managed care system, which would actually save the health care system overall. Because when you're looking at Obamacare, you are talking about counties that are going to have zero providers Absolutely. Uh, under Obamacare well, because the, they can't make money because of what you just I, said. I, I there, will tell you, won't you have young and healthy people. Right, in but these. but I will tell you, I think one of the critical things we need to do is we need to fix 18. And how you do that is you get uh, you, you guarantee the cost uh, sharing payments and you do some kind of reinsurance to get people mm -hmm. back in the market. And I think if we were focusing instead on, on 18, on the, on the um, plan year 18, and then having a broader discussion, I think we could come up with fixes. 2018, you mean? Yeah, for, 2018. For letting um, there be clarity for yeah. what the insurance because, companies Because Because a lot of insurance companies are saying, well, my, no my premium will increase mm -hmm. 8%, yeah. but it's going to be 22 because of the uncertainty in the, in the government payment. Just, just want to come back to a point you already touched on, which is this is a sixth of the U.S. economy. It's 17% of GDP in the U.S., no matter who's paying for it. Most of the other developed nations are between 8 and 10 percent on health care. So, so how, how has it got to that point and can that come down again or, or is the starting point it's always going to be that much, that much spent on health care in the U.S.? No, I think that it has to come down. If we're going to be competitive, we talk about taxes making us uncompetitive, we talk about regulation making us uncompetitive. I'll tell you what makes American businesses uncompetitive is the high percentage of costs that they have to pay for health care. I mean, it's a fluke of, of our history that we do it this way. But I, again, it's taking a look at at curative medicine, what I call curative medicine. When you go to the doctor, you get a prescription or you get a procedure, you intertwine that with behavior and mental health and with public health initiatives, which should lower costs. 
and but lowering costs depends on changing patient behavior and that's a challenge always when you say you can get as sick as you want and we're still going to cover you which i think we have to but but we have to have that conversation about how we can do this and you know who's leading the way is self-insured businesses who are working all kinds of models. We could look at those models and say, that works. How do we provide flexibility in the system to, to, to accomplish exactly that? Dr. Heidkamp is actually back on the set. She has a question for you. Great. Hey, hey Bob. Um, Senator. You know, there's a lot of talk again about institutions being too big to fail um, and uh, the four largest getting larger. Um, do you think that there's hope that we could do small bank and regional bank reform to provide that competition and to put some of the other Dodd-Frank issues like uh, uh, large bank issues off to the side? Do you think that would help with competition and with the too big to fail problem? Of course. I think that the question really about Dodd-Frank is that we watch when regulation responds to a crisis. And you wrote the definitive book uh, about this and, and about the time of that period. And, and basically, I think a lot of us believe that the pendulum might have swung too far. And in particular, as the senator suggests, that with regard to small financial institutions, there's a weight on them that seems unnecessary. So taking some of that weight off has to be stimulative for growth. And we as you suggest, segregating that out from the more complex issues of too big to fail seems like a progressive or a positive force for the economy. Let's get back to our guest hosts and talk about U.S. crude and natural gas production. Senator Heidi Heitkamp from North Dakota. Senator, uh, we've seen in one week crude oil down by 4.4 percent. At what point does it get concerning in your view? Well, I, you can't change investment decisions on a dime. And so everybody was counting on that 50 plus. I think we saw a tremendous amount of stability over that time period in terms of domestic investments. We saw investments come back to North Dakota. We saw increased production. Um, obviously, there is a price point at which people, it will again slow down. I don't think we're here and I don't think we have stability yet in price that will slow it down, but it will definitely um, get us back to production and less exploration. One of the things we don't talk enough about is that right now we know where the oil is. I mean, we know how to produce it. We're producing it more efficiently. That's a great story that's not told often enough. But what happens when we, the known reserves um, uh, began to uh, uh, decline curve and we have not done enough exploration because there hasn't been money in exploration? What, what, what is the price point? Is it $50 that you see additional uh, production? Or is that when, what's the price point, the, the kind of the cliff for when you actually see more uh, exploration if, as well? If you had asked me um, 18 months months ago, I would have told you it was 60. Mm. Um, but we continue to be more and more efficient, in part because we know where the oil is, we know how to get it. We're much more efficient in terms of extraction, especially in shale plays. Can but, people but in your state I don't make know. money at this level at $43? Um, you know, one of the things, and I know I was here before touting the oil exports, reducing the spread between West Texas and Brent has made a huge difference. And as dollar values decline, that's going to make a difference as well. And so, you know, I, 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 I would hesitate to give you a number because this is an industry that has been much more nimble than what people ever thought. It's moving thought. that fast. Yeah. There's, there's still quite a big price gap with uh, Asian LNG prices uh, and domestic right. gas prices. I mean, ha Henry Hub prices. H how much opportunity is there for the U.S. to be exporting oil or gas and, and where would you how far away are we from that happening seriously well I think we're, we're going to continue to see expansion in oil um, and export of oil in part because our refineries don't refine what we produce in in massive quantities and especially in shale but natural gas is a real opportunity and there is kind of this push-pull because one of the reasons why you see chemical manufacturers coming back why you see advanced manufacturing in the United States is low natural gas prices Every, nobody really talks about mm -hmm. that as a driver. Everybody kind of wants to hang on to that. If we continue to export, what's going to happen with st stability of natural gas prices? What I say is that if you keep natural gas prices artificially low, you will curtail investment and curtail production. And so eventually we're going to have to see some stabilization. We're going to see uh, for the first time probably a natural gas kind of international market that's going to establish um, more international pricing of natural gas. So the president is expected to make a speech at the Depart Department of Energy on Thursday, and the focus is expected to be exports. You were instrumental in the 2015 export law. What Have you been working with the administration? What would you 
like to see on the export front in terms of uh, expanding it and in what areas? I would love to see more LNG export terminals. I think that's good for our trading partners. I think it's really good for stabilization of our, of our allies. One of the things that um, we know is that in order to get natural gas, you may be doing deals with people you don't want to do deals with. We want to be that alternative. Um, but we also want to make sure that we don't destabilize natural gas prices here in the United States. What are you talking about specifically? So helping Europe perhaps not rely on Russia or, or, or other Absolutely. specific areas? And, 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 and Japan. And looking at how, where those markets are and how we can, in fact, um, integrate ourselves. I was just up in Norway, saw their export terminal for their natural gas. And so this is something that I think um, is going to be, it's going to surprise us in a year to see what's happening with the movement of uh, natural gas across the, uh, across the, the, um, the water. Let's get some final thoughts from our special guest host, Senator Heidi Heitkamp from North Dakota. Uh, Senator, I just want to follow up on the conversation with Bob Steele very quickly there. Uh -huh. Are there some areas of financial deregulation where there could be cross-party support and could come regardless of, of what's happening with health care bills and tax reform? Absolutely. I think for small banks, we already have a lot of that done. The Democrats proposed a, a bill last session, or last Congress, that I think we could have passed. And it had unanimous support on, the, on, the, on our side of the aisle. The trick will be the regional and mid-sized banks, which I think need um, the support, need to reduce compliance burdens. Um, they're not systemically significant. They shouldn't have those burdens, and they need to be there in the competitive market against the bigger banks. I mean, financial deregulation, though, is still fairly political as a topic. Very, many of your colleagues criticized the Treasury white paper. Y your view on that from, from uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin? I actually thought it was pretty moderate. Um, I expected something a lot broader and bigger. Um, there's things obviously I don't agree with, but there's also things that I think we can in fact do. And you're going to see hopefully in this Congress something get done. I said at a hearing uh, a couple days ago, I said, look, I'm tired of talking about it. I've mm -hmm. been talking about it for four years. I want to get it done and move on. Senator, 10 seconds left. Your hunch, will the Republicans get the bill through the Senate? Um, the health care bill, sorry? I never bet against Mitch McConnell. I think you're a fool if you do. <laughs> Senator, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Pleasure to have you with us.